A debate. A debate. Oh, okay, that, fair enough. We can do a debate. I can dig that. Um, all right. They are going to be debating the question, will we soon realistically emulate biological systems? I'm going to let Mike explain a little bit more about that, and he's going to moderate our, uh, our debate today. So please welcome Michael Vassar once again to the stage, president of the Singularity Institute. So, hi again. Hi, Terry. Hi, Dennis. So, um, I saw Terry speaking about, in Scientific American, about how we were going to understand the brain pretty soon, really surprisingly soon to me. <coughs> and I said, wow, that's pretty cool, given his uh, prominence as a neuroscientist. And I always want to have a skeptic, so I have Dennis come in. Uh, last year we had Stuart Hameroff, and Dennis is definitely also in the bio biology does interesting stuff that we don't understand yet shtick. There seems to be a conflict between those two attitudes, and I'd like to have a... Uh, Terry and Dennis talk and figure out why they have different intuitions, both coming from biological perspective, about whether we are pretty close to understanding th these things or not. I, I guess my major thought is that both Terry and Dennis seem to be taking much more extreme claims than I think is typical within the field, but nonetheless, they're you know still talking the same language. So let's have it, Terry. Well, I'm going to use the computer for uh, a little bit. Can you put that? So. Uh, Dennis has thrown down the gauntlet, and uh, I think that um, I've been scrambling to think of what I could possibly do to reply, since I actually agree with a lot of the things that he said. <laughs> um, and I, I'd actually like to point out um, one of the weaknesses in my own talk, if I'm allowed to. Um, <laughs> No, 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 this is it's, it's really an important point, and it's one that Dennis made, which was that the bacteria, the lowly bacteria in one cell has to do everything. It has to sense, perceive, make decisions, and it has to have a motor output, and it has to survive on its own autonomously in a variable world that's very harsh. And none of the systems that you've seen today, I think, are capable, even close to doing that. Uh, and in particular, the, the backgammon program that I told you about, TD Gammon, lives in a, wrapped in a digital cocoon. It has very limited sensory, there's no sensory input, it's just a game board that's, you know, digital. And the only output is, uh, you know, uh, there's no motor system. It, it's, it's just pure symbols, if you will. And, and it, for that reason, it was used as, a, as an example in AI for uh, a, a domain where you can make progress without having to have a, solve the sensory and the motor problems, but it turns out the sensory and the motor problems are the hard problems. It's, it's not the decisions necessarily. So here's the bacteria. And I think Dennis really laid out the, uh, the groundwork. We know we have a parts list. We, have the, uh, lot, we know a lot about where the proteins are located. The spatial lo location is incredibly important, how they're clustered together and where the molecules, where the receptors are uh, on the front or the back. It's very small. This is only about uh, uh, one, two microns across, so it's uh, in the micron range. And if we ask, you know, what's comparable to the bacteria in the brain, probably the thing that comes the closest to it is the synapse. Remember I told you the synapse is the most numerous computational mm. element in the brain, 10 to the 15th of them. Um, and, and we heard that in the bacteria there were about uh, a billion proteins, and it's probably, you know, they're a little bit smaller than bacteria, but it's the same order of magnitude. And so the question is, how are we going to make progress? And I think we have to bite the bullet. I think we're going to have to simulate every single molecule in the synapse. In fact, we're doing that. Uh, we put together a program called MCEL. It uses a Monte Carlo mm. technique. It's, uh, mathematicians use it to simulate diffusion. And we use it to simulate the diffusion of neurotransmitter in these small molecules. And, and one of the th things about the bacteria is that it's so small that a signal can, uh, uh, you don't need a wire. You can simply get the molecule from one end to the other end in a millisecond or so by virtue of the fact that it's undergoing a random walk within the bacteria itself. And the same thing's true of these synapses. So here's a, a dendritic shaft. Here's a spine coming off the dendrite. Here's the presynaptic terminal. And the transmitter is released. And here's a little schematic. We 
are able with this uh, program to, to first of all uh, create a realistic geometry that's actually reconstructed from an actual EM uh, set of photographs and we're able to put into our model every molecule that we know is there and its function are, uh, are, are actually implemented using Monte Carlo methods and, and particularly uh, uh, Markov models for the opening and closing of ion channels, uh, entry of calcium into the postsynaptic spine, binding to calmodulin and calmodulin activates CAM kinase 2. We're simulating every single one of those steps and Dennis actually had a whole piece in his talk about that molecule, CAM kinase 2. Uh, we're collaborating with Mary Kennedy in order to be able to have a realistic model of that molecule. So here's uh, snapshots in the simulation. Here's the spine head. Here's the uh, vesicle containing <coughs> 3,000 molecules of glutamate. At time zero, they're released. Uh, shortly thereafter, uh, two microseconds later, you can see they've dispersed over the surface of the, of the synapse. And the red is the part which contains the receptors. And you can see that by uh, 15 microseconds, the receptors are already being bound. Uh, by um, a tenth of a millisecond, that's 100 microseconds, you can see the transmitter has already diffused away. So this is over in a blink of an eye, you know, of an eye blink. It's a really a very short period of time. But now the receptors start opening and closing, and in particular the NMDA receptor. And that lets calcium coming in. That's the white dots. And then after 100 milliseconds, that's cleared out. But there's still signals, and we can trace each one of these signals. And so we're, we're actually including in our, if you think about this for a second, this is really, it takes a tremendous amount of computing power to simulate every single important molecule, the kinetics, opening and closing of ion channels, the flow of current, and so forth. And I'm going to illustrate that for you. Here's the, the model that we use. It's a reconstructed piece of neuropil from the hippocampus. You heard about that uh, earlier. Um, five by five by five cubic microns. <clears throat> These are two, the green and the yellow are two dendrites out of 150 that are in this chunk of neuropil. Uh, the blue little uh, line there is an axon, which is one out of 450. And uh, the, uh, what you're seeing here is, is just one out of many, many elements. And I'm going to, if you can have the lights down, I'll, I'll close by showing you a simulation. What we did was we simulated the release of neurotransmitter as input came into this area of the hippocampus from outside. And so you're going to see these elementary releases. And we need the lights out because this is a dim. Can you turn the lights off? I'm guessing they can't because they don't seem to be like that. OK. Oh, good. That, that's, that helps a lot. OK. OK, so here it goes. It's a log time scale. Oh. Let's. It's too bad. That. <clears throat> So uh, you'll see the movie in a second, but what it illustrates is, is the actual dynamics. Okay, the, the whole simulation is only simulating a fraction, again, 100 milliseconds, but we're, we're speeding, it, we're slowing it down so that you actually see what it actually looks like. But it gives you a sense for what it's like to be inside the neuropil. And let's see. Okay. So these are the uh, glutamate molecules, and the yellow are the uh, glutamate binding to the transporters on the glial cells. So that's one synaptic release. And now we're going to pull back, and you're going to see a little bit more of the neuropil. Each one of these little areas is a synapse. It's the postsynaptic density. There are 405 of them in this chunk of tissue. The music I, I, we added in later. So imagine you're in the brain, and this is what it looks like when there is a barrage of inputs coming in. Each one of those is activating a single synapse. You don't see the dendrites, but it's, the information is being transmitted out of this chunk of the neuropil down to the cell body, and then from there to other neurons.
Okay. <clears throat> and as soon as Dennis tells us the function of all the molecules, we'll put them in our simulator and simulate the bacteria. <laughs> Track, but <laughs> I'm going to ask him to come up and uh, give a rebuttal anyway. Okay. Now this is this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for me to acknowledge a debt of gratitude I have because in um, I think it was 1989, a visitor to my lab in London, Jerry Pine, came and told us about all the exciting things that were going on at, in, in Caltech, and he told us about the work that uh, you were doing on NetTalk. And I thought it was the most thrilling thing I'd heard, uh, and actually I immediately saw possibilities of, <coughs> I, I, I thought the, the, the ability of uh, autonomous u units to learn patterns was just wonderful. And I, I could immediately see applications inside cells. So, uh, and I'm sure I'm not the only one to have been inspired by your, your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. However. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, what, Neural networks actually illustrate something that, that bothers me uh, about a lot of the uh, modeling that go, that, 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 that's performed. Now, I'm convinced that something like neural networks must, must occur in, in brains because it's such an, a, a natural explanation for pattern recognition. But I'm told by people who, who know that, in fact, it's very hard to identify in any real piece of brain tissue something that corresponds to a neural network, as, 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 as Sinovsky and uh, Rosenberg, was it Rosenberg? Yes. Yeah, uh, described. And, and the reason is not hard to understand. First of all, the components are not all identical, as they are in a neural network. I would say, in, in fact, that every nerve cell is different. Secondly, you don't know what the input and output so you don't know what the rules of modification of the, the, the synapses are, uh, the connections. And so, although a neural network, I'm convinced, represents an essence of something that goes on in the brain, this is not reverse engineering. Okay. So, uh, to, to, to a degree, it's a pedantic point. But to me, reverse engineering means that you give me your mobile phone, and I start to take it to bits. Maybe you give me your second best one. And, uh, and I record where everything is, and I will record where everything's gone, and, I, and then I finish up with a whole array of parts, and then I can put them back together again. Now, that's manifestly impossible for the brain. You, you must, no, nobody's suggesting that you can do that for the brain. So what I think you, you've been talking about, if, 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 at least not the way I understand it, is not reverse engineering, but, but uh, biologically inspired modeling. So then the question, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I, we're actually not as, as far apart as, 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 as the organizers seem to think. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, you sort of shot my fox by saying that you want to go to the molecular level, because uh, that's, that, that was exactly my point. Um, in fact, we, we, our mutual friend Francis Crick once, once told me that uh, explanations at the molecular level have a, a unique power because they, they can be verified in so many different ways. So if you make a statement about uh, a molecule such as the third amino acid is leucine, you can, you can, there's a dozen techniques you can, you can uh, verify that. You can, you can make mutants. You can look at up other proteins. And you can get a, 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 you can verif verify models at a level of, of certainty that I don't think applies at higher levels. So the, these, 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 uh, these uh, <coughs> simulations, which are based on sort of stereotypical off-the-shelf uh, neurons, may behave in a way that resembles what goes in the brain. But they, they're not a substitute for actually knowing what's going on inside the brain itself. How am I doing for time? All right, so another five minutes. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, with, with the greatest respect to everyone, I think we have to be, be very careful. We, there, there are many things we don't know about the nervous system. And um, just, as a, uh, just as an example, uh, 15 years ago, if you'd asked uh, any, almost any biologist what most of the DNA in a cell was doing, they'd either say it was junk or they'd say it was structural or if they were really sophisticated, they'd say, well, it's a substrate for evolution, whatever. 
We now know that a large fraction of that, or a significant fraction, is converted into small RNAs. Those small RNAs diffuse through the cell, they interfere with, particularly with gene expression, but they may do many other things. And that, uh, yes, they're in nerve cells, and yes, they're in synapses. So where are the small RNAs in your uh, M cell simulation? They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> And since a paradigm, how am I doing for time? Since a paradigm is, everybody seems to assume that you have the neurons, you have the synapses, the synapses are modifiable. There are other things going on. There's a chemistry going on. Some, some neurons are frankly neurosecretory. But there's also this interesting, some interesting work on certain kinds of long-term memory from David Sweet and, and, and colleagues in the University of, of Alabama. Which, uh, which, which reveals that certain kinds of memory uh, are actually not stored in synapses at all, but are, are embedded in the, in the DNA, in the methylation of the DNA and the acetylation of the histone. And it, it appears that this so-called epigenetic memory that's involved uh, in, de in development has been hijacked, at least in some cases, to, to actually store memories in the brain. Now, I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows just how, how widespread this phenomenon is. But it's certainly something that's not incorporated into most people's models. So uh, I, don't, I didn't really want to be cast in, the, in a reactionary sort of <laughs> uh, platform, but uh, I, I, think, I think things are moving along wonderfully, and I'm sure that, that uh, uh, you know, the future is bright and that the, these things will be uncovered. But as for right now, I don't think we're there yet. My turn? Yeah. Okay. So uh, there are a number of very important points you made. And um, you, you brought up NetTalk as an example. And that takes me back you know, 25 years. Um, that was what Francis Crick would call a demonstration model. In other words, it wasn't meant to model a particular part of the brain. And what it demonstrated was that even with a relatively modest sized network of oversimplified neurons. I think there were like 300 in, uh, of, of these model neurons in, in three layers. There was an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. But we were able to train it using supervised learning to be able to convert English letters in words into sounds, which is a very difficult problem in English because it's so variable. And, and we don't, by any means, thought that this was actually replicating some little piece of the cortical circuit. It, it simply was a proof of principle that mm. you didn't need a whole set of rules to, in order to accomplish that. There, there are, phonologists have books of rules, which, and exceptions to the rules, and rules for the exceptions, and you know, it's rules all the way down. But, uh, but this little network, very modest, was able to uh, incorporate not just the regularities, but also the exceptions. And I think it, it demonstrated that there's a different architecture out there and that we should be searching in the space of architectures for something that would, might be more appropriate uh, for the actual cortex. And that's what I've been working on ever since. Now, Francis Crick told me something else, which I think uh, really hits the spot. And I think it really is, I uh, guess, the core of the issue here. And, and that has to do with the model itself. So he said, Terry, you're overly fond of your models. <clears throat> and I had to admit, I thought they were pretty good. But he said that. It's not an end in itself, but rather it's a way to design the killer experiment. To design an experiment you wouldn't have done otherwise to reveal something you didn't know. And, and I think the example of the Wolfram Schultz experiment is an example of that. Even though it's a, you know, the, the, the models were very primitive and very uh, unbiological, as you pointed out, at that level, at the level of systems, it really did re I think it does reveal something important about the architecture. And I think that uh, in a similar way that the models now that we're developing at the molecular level, even though they're incomplete, I think they're going to be telling us you know, where to look next, what's missing. If the model doesn't actually replicate the behavior, then there's something that we don't know and we'll learn if we go and now search to find the missing piece. Mm. Well. Well, I'm pretty convinced, actually. <laughs> I, I, I suggest we take questions. Is that, that all right? Yeah. We can open up, no. up to the audience. We've got 20 minutes, so uh, feel free. Go speak yourself. Great. Worst fight to the death ever. <laughs>
Audience Q&A, anyone? The floor is open. It's all yours. So uh, there's a lot of politeness, and uh, I would like to really get at the crux of the differences in terms of, uh, Dennis Bray, maybe, what are the issues that you see that are going to make it implausible, for instance, to really gain something that has some, that has the functionality that people are really interested when they think of as a brain emulation? So, I mean, where are the okay. points of, of crucial difference, as you see? Okay, well, I, I should really emphasize that it's not a, a um, I don't see a, 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 a barrier a, a, a in principle. I don't, I'm not saying that there's something in the brain that's non-physical or non-chemical, non uh, and I'm certainly, um, uh, nor do I think that it, it, it's impossible to model it. I just don't think at the moment, if you look at any part of the brain, uh, well, there are people here who know much more than I do, but my, my perception uh, of the field is that it, you really don't know the circuitry, the detailed chemistry of any part of the brain to be able to build a, a model at the level of individual molecules such as Terry was describing. Now that, that was, you know, pretty impressive uh, um, demonstration, anima, uh, animation using M cell. But when you said that that had all of the molecules in the synapse, that, that that can't be true, right? I mean, there must be uh, all of the hundreds of different molecules in the synapse. Right. Uh, so what you saw was just the release of the transmitter, which is the first step. And then the goal of the model is to follow that signal as it goes into the postsynaptic cell. Uh, the calcium, you saw the calcium going in. Uh, the calcium binds the CAM, so we have CAM in the model. Uh, it binds, the, 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 the calmodulin binds to the CAM kinase 2 and it autophosphorylates and that's as far as we've gotten. In other words, we're taking it one step at a time and we're about 100 milliseconds into the chemical reactions. The idea is to you know, use time as an essential variable because not all of the proteins are important at the same time. Different time constants, different parts, uh, different molecules are located in different locations in the neuron and, and so you, you really have to look at the microdomains to see what's happening locally, and, and that's where we're actually we're focusing primarily in the spine and also on the postsynaptic density. And it's a, a tool that we're using for exploring. It, it does by no means is it complete, and I actually don't even think that our goal is to be complete right now. Our goal is to try to understand some basic principles that we can then use for guiding the next experiment. Could I just come back on that too? I mean. What you're doing, the only thing that the, you're approaching it in the only way possible. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, not saying you're not, but I mean, if, if, if you wanted to learn how a, um, if you wanted to d develop a robot that was able to pick up this, this bottle of water and do that, okay, you'd have to know what the circuits are. You don't also have, I mean, the, in the real world, the way it learns, it, I mean, it's, it's not sort of set in stone. Everything it, it does is corrected and uh, is plastic. And so you'd have to know what the ba on, on what basis the different synapses are being uh, strengthened or weakened and corrected. And that requires knowing uh, how synapses grow and shrink and how, um, how the receptors are inserted and, or, or removed. It requires knowing how the processing of an individual neuron is changed. And I, d I don't think we're anywhere near doing that yet. Well, you know, what's remarkable, I mean, this is, that's what the exponential is, right? <laughs> is that um, with uh, every year, the, the number of experiments that can be done and the, the quality of the data is getting better and better. And so we have to anticipate the fact that if we don't yet have those facts or figures or uh, densities, that we will in the near future. Uh, it's just a matter of time. So we were preparing for that. Uh, but I should mention there's an irony here uh, to go back to Dennis's comment about uh, NetTalk, which is that if you look at that generation of neural networks, which consisted of units that were um, based on rate, firing rate, um, and the equations, there were sigmoid equations, it turns out that those networks are actually much better models for the enzymatic reactions inside cells than they are for real neurons. Real neurons have spikes, these the very fast uh, signals, and th th there's uh, short-term synaptic plasticity, there's uh, many, many more uh, temporal dynamical uh, timescales that need to be taken into account. 
But it turns out that uh, the, 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 all the work that was done back then now can be actually used for understanding something about the, the, the systems biology of the chemical reactions that may be going on inside cells. So there's, you know, even if it's not a good model for uh, neuron, maybe it is a good model for your problem. So um, I'll get to each of you guys alternating. The guy in the pur purple shirt back there. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, uh, uh, two questions, but I'll just uh, see if I can ask the first one. <laughs> the uh, uh, one is, it, it seems that a lot of behavior, say for instance, that a human baby, as soon as it's born, it's, it knows how to, say for instance, cry in order to seek food or help or whatever. And that, presumably that behavior is not learned. It's, it's, it's in, embedded within, presumably, or possibly the DNA <coughs> of, of, a, of a single human cell. Um, and yet, it's, and, and it's not in the gene encoding DNA, it's in the regulatory, the, the non-encoding. Has, has there been any research yet or any discoveries that can say, oh, these segments of DNA represent this higher level behavior ultimately? Or say, for instance, when a, 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 an antelope is born, it, can, it fears tigers. So the concept of a tiger is, is somehow embedded in its behavior. Um, and the, uh... Okay, so yeah, you're, you, that raises the age-old question of what's innate and what's learned. And um, the answer to that is a is, is, is very interesting one, and it turns out that uh, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, pre-encoded information that's learned over evolutionary times that's put into the DNA that is, is transmitted through a developmental program and thereby makes, there, that makes it very difficult to point to any gene and connect it to any behavior, right? It, it, the, each gene contributes to the development of the circuit and gives it the probabilities that neurons will connect, but it doesn't actually specify that neuron A connects to B because there's not enough information. I mean, Ray Kurzweil was, mentioned that. I mean, he did the calculation for you. But what's clear is that at every stage along the way, even before birth, the sensory input coming in can actually modify which genes are being turned on and off, right? So the experience is already playing out in the womb that will help determine which circuits are going to be relevant for that species. And, and different, by the way, the, the, uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, the reason why babies are so helpless is that they're actually born prematurely. In, in, in other words, they, they come out of the womb because, you know, the, the birth canal is not big enough to keep them in there. Right, if, 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 the, if you can keep them in for a couple of years, they might be, also be able to walk when they get out. Dennis, anything to add? No. All right, Brad? So you both concurred on the, uh, um, the value of doing the molecular models uh, to, build, to get these understandings. But my understanding, and I think many people's understanding, is that it's going to be necessary to make more abstract, higher level models um, in order to actually implement these things at the speeds even that we predict for processors in the future. So what do you feel about the progress in making these abstractions? Will these molecular models allow us to deduce the more abstract models? Will they allow us to find them through evolutionary searches uh, so that we can compare what we now hopefully have as a realistic molecular model with what our abstract models predict? Is this something you have optimism about or pessimism about? Uh, and how do, you, how do you forecast the roadmap for that sort of work? Well, well, I would say that it's going to be, uh, I mean, I, uh, despite what you think, I mean, I'm pretty optimistic about it. <laughs> I, I, it's going to be a process of increasing, uh, increasingly high resolution. So, so it seems to me that you, you could, could already um, um, have pretty crude models of large-scale tracks in the brain and, you know, which, what, what different nuclei do. And uh, you can already make pretty, pretty uh, coarse-level models. Uh, and then as, as you learn more and more about individual parts of the brain going down to the, 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 the morphology of individual neurons and then even into the, the chemistry, then those can be added to the models. Now most of, most of the stuff at the molecular level is not going to be relevant actually. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's just going to be housekeeping or and it's not going to be germane to the model. But you've got to know which ones are the important ones. But Michael, to, uh, you didn't get you a know. proper skeptic, because I've seen the skeptics declare they think every molecular thing is going to be essential. Yeah, but they're <laughs> no, strictly wrong, because thermodynamically that can't be the case. You'd need to erase so many bits that your brain would, like, 
vaporize the room to think for a second? I, I think there's a, another way to answer that, which is that um, if it, 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 there is no one model. And uh, it, it basically, you need a different model for every behavior that you're trying to model. And the essence of a model is not to include every little detail. The essence is to figure out what's essential and what's not. And that's the triumph of physics was figuring out you know, what you have to pay attention to. It's not the color of the object, it's the mass right, and the velocity. And similarly, it, it, the process of figuring out you know, the function, say, of a synapse is to figure out for every single property of the synapse, you know, f facilitation, depression, um, long-term potentiation, each one of those different functions, which are the relevant genes and proteins that are responsible for that function, and which ones you can leave aside that aren't important. So it, you, you really need different models, and also at the highest level of abstractions, you're uh, lumping together a lot of the parameters at the lower level. So therefore, it's, it, the analogy that I, I think is the easiest to see is uh, the, the level in, uh, if you, you can describe a gas by the um, simple molecular condition, collisions and use kinetic theory to, to derive a, a statistical mechanics, which then averages out and tells you what the pressure and the volume is and the relationship between them. So you have a gas law here at the macroscopic level that subsumes all the molecular details down here, and it's irrelevant what the molecules are. You'll get the same gas law. All right, in the back again. Hi. Um, it seems to me that specialization of the brain cells uh, allows them to process inputs in ways that are representative of uh, real-world relationships and the built-in knowledge uh, that the brain has evolved. Has you, have you considered simulating the specialization of brain cells to correctly uh, simulate how the brain would process inputs? Well, one of the, I think uh, the, the, the good points that Dennis made was that um, every, every neuron is unique in the sense that it has a different history and therefore it has a different um, input-output relationship by virtue of, of that history. In fact, uh, it, it's, if you think about it, 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 here we have a computer whose hardware is actually changing as we talk, right? That your brain is not the same when you walk out of this room as it was when you walked in. At least I hope it isn't. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, the, each of the neurons will become specialists in some particular part of your brain for a particular concept that you heard today, a particular sensory impression, a joke perhaps. Of, you know, again, Francis Crick was counseled, and he said that, um, you know, be careful about the jokes be, uh, that you tell because that's probably only, the only thing that the audience will remember 10 years from now. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Dennis, anything else? Okay. Uh, All right. Up in front. Um, I believe the saying goes something to the effect that uh, if it walks like a neuron and talks like a neuron and quacks like a neuron, uh, what's the difference? And um, uh, certainly, um, projects like the Blue Brain Project uh, are not using realistic neurons uh, by any means by any means, but uh, they are getting roughly sort of broad stroke uh, realistic results. And I'm wondering sort of, um, I mean, following the gentleman ahead of me, uh, how accurate do we have to be? And specifically, if there are sort of a large number of uh, gotchas like epigenetic memory. Uh, well, I, I, I would say that we just don't know how, how much it remains to be known, uh, but almost by definition. So, so for example, if that, if that wedge of brain had to uh, become proficient at some, some task, then, then it would have to be, uh, change its connections and modify, uh, uh, mo all the cells would have to be modified. I mean, the, thi the thing that impresses me is that living cells are continually keeping a record of their environment. So everything that happens outside a cell is somehow reflected on the inside. And evolution has selected the mechanisms so that it knows what Im what's important and what's not important. And it actually enables cells to, in a sense, predict the future because things have happened before and it's really good at uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, changing. So I would say that in a real brain, a particular nerve cell would be primed to certain changes. You know. 
And unless you, unless you went into that nerve cell and you, you, you looked at all the clusters of different proteins in the synapses, you might not be able to, to know that. So it, it, in, in a sense, it's a question of resolution, okay, uh, again. So it, it, the, the, the more detailed you need to get to, the more you have to sort of penetrate down to these molecular um, details. So um, with regard to Henry Markram, uh, he hasn't quite gotten to the point yet of incorporating the plasticity, which I uh, completely agree is essential. And I particularly uh, like the idea of the inside of the cell predicting the patterns of inputs it's getting. And in fact, the essence of temporal difference, you remember, is the idea that it's predicting what the uh, future reward is based on the <coughs> current environment. And that's a prediction that is being made by the, the, the circuit. Um, uh, the, the, I think uh, once, so in a sense, what Henry has done is basically delivered a, you know, what, what perhaps development creates before there's any input. In fact, the, one of the problems, you know, I've seen movies of flashes of light and things. The problem is that there's no visual input to the thing and there's no motor output. So how do you know what it's doing, mm -hmm. right? It, 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 it actually looks more like what the, maybe the cortex looks like during sleep, but it's not really doing anything, right? So uh, once it starts doing something, uh, it, you really are going to need to include all of these different uh, mechanisms that are plastic and are changing over time, and that will differentiate all the different cells that he has. I think he does take into account some variety of parameters, but I think it's more important that the, r the right combination of parameters are put together, and that only happens through experience. All right, back there, one, maybe two more questions, so. Okay, my husband, Hal, has a question for Terry. Uh, I enjoyed your uh, movie of the uh, glutamate uh, splashing around there. I have a neurological condition which is thought to be due in part to excess uh, glutamate not being absorbed sufficiently by the glial cells and causing uh, too much excitation, what they call excitotoxicity, um, which kills the uh, neural cells. So the movie looked, it was very dramatic to see this process, which apparently is malfunctioning in my body. but. I think when I've looked at the medical research, they actually don't have a great deal of confidence in their knowledge about the details, <coughs> details of these processes. In fact, they actually aren't even sure to what extent excitotoxicity is happening. They don't really know if the glial cells are failing to take up glutamate properly. So you can make a movie, make a model, but it seems that there's a gap between what's going on in real bodies, in real biology, that you're not really necessarily able to know what is happening at that level. Right, well, what you're pointing out is uh, the big gap between uh, where we are now in terms of being able to incorporate all of those mechanisms and being able to make predictions about uh, what may be uh, happening in, in uh, different medical conditions. Now, M cell, uh, is, is an, it's the, it, the way to think about it is that it's a tool for being able to ask questions. Like, for example, um, if I were, uh, studying the condition of excitotoxicity, I would ask, suppose I developed a drug that would target this particular transporter uh, uh, and change the kinetics in a certain way, would that help at all? And I could run the simulations and I could see what impact it had. Uh, it, it, it might help or it might have side effects, uh, but I can do millions of experiments like that and I can sort out and, and reduce the number of possible uh, the contingencies that uh, otherwise you'd have to test experimentally. In other words, I could speed up the process of search for better uh, therapeutics. Uh, and, and of course, that would have to be done with uh, medical 
uh, expertise that would have to be done with neurobi neurobiological data of all the molecules that are there and, and others that maybe we, we don't f sufficiently appreciate. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, we're not there yet, I agree. But we're, 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 trying, to, we're trying to help. To, oh, just, yes. to, just a quick point. I mean, uh, that, uh, that, thank you. That's a very good point. I mean, uh, I, I'd ignored glial cells, but of course, you know, uh, the functioning of the nervous system's brain depends on the, the, the supporting cells, the blood vessels, you know, all of these things have to be uh, n uh, understood and incorporated in any re you know, truly realistic model. We, we did, by the way, in that simulator, we did have the glial cells, the astrocytes, and we did have the transporters. And in fact, I didn't have time to tell you, but when the glutamate binds to the transporter, it turns yellow, and then it becomes irreversible because it could pop off, it turns red. So you, the colors that you were seeing were trying to simulate exactly the mechanisms that you were bringing up uh, to the best of our ability. And what was interesting was that in that big volume, there was a single glial cell. The whole thing was a big meshwork, uh, which is you know, really remarkable. Yeah, that's amazing. All right, that is interesting, and that's it for today. We'll uh, have another event tomorrow.